Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Geological Society's virtual public lecture, Martian Organics, Linking Meteorites and Missions with Lydia Hallis. Throughout this lecture, your microphone will be muted and your video cameras will be switched off. You'll only be able to hear and see the speakers. I'm Dr. Megan O'Donnell, and I'm a Communications and Policy Officer here at the Geological Society. Today, Lydia will explore the main aim of several missions to Mars to determine whether life evolved on our small red neighbor. These missions are aiming to determine if organic compounds are present in the soils and rocks of Mars and eventually return samples to Earth for detailed study. However, Martian rocks are already present on Earth in the form of meteorites, and these rocks are known to contain organic compounds too. During this talk, Lydia will outline what we can learn from these meteorites and how they might help our investigations on the Martian surface. Dr. Lydia Hallis graduated from Imperial College in 2006 with an MSci in geology. From there, she moved to the Natural History Museum in London to study for a PhD focused on the geology of the moon. She worked mostly with Apollo samples. In 2010, she began work as a postdoctoral NASA astrobiology research fellow at the University of Hawaii. Her current research at the University of Glasgow includes the study of the mineralogy and the chemistry of achondrite meteorites, which are those that originate from a rocky planet or a large asteroid. Now, she's particularly focused on how these planetary bodies retain volatile elements, such as hydrogen and carbon, during the hot conditions of their formation. There'll be a 15 minute question and answer session at the end of Lydia's presentation. So please do submit all your questions into the Q&A box function in Zoom. Unfortunately, we may not be able to answer every single one, but we'll do our very best. And finally, this video will be live streamed and recorded to our YouTube channel and uploaded for anybody to watch at any time on the Geological Society's channel. Without further ado, over to Lydia. Thanks, Megan. So yes, today I'm going to be talking about Martian organics and specifically how we link the mission data that we get from Martian organic compounds to the meteorites that we have present here on Earth that we know are from Mars. So this year has been a really, really busy year for Martian missions. There have been three successful missions that have already either landed or inserted into orbit around the red planet. The first was the United Arab Emirates Hope Orbiter, which was inserted into orbit this February. Then we had the NASA Mars 2020 Perseverance rover successfully land on the surface of Mars and the Ingenuity helicopter, which is attached to the Perseverance rover, has now had five successful flights around the surface of Mars. So that landed also in February this year. And then the China National Space Academy had an orbiter, a lander and the Zurong rover land successfully um, at the surface of Mars this month in May 2021. So this rover has just successfully left its uh, landing pad and is uh, currently exploring the surface of Mars. And that makes China only the second country to successfully land anything on the surface of Mars. So that's after um, NASA with the USA. So this year has been very busy. It's also been very successful. And as you can see from this diagram, we have become more and more successful at um, orbiting, uh, flybys, landers and rover missions as time has gone by. So early on, um, the Martian missions were pretty unsuccessful. Um, uh, we, we only landed something successfully on the surface of Mars uh, the first time in 1975, and those were the two Viking missions, so Viking 1 and Viking 2. They were successful landers uh, by NASA, and they explored the Martian atmospheric composition. They took some photographs, um, and then it wasn't until 1996 that we had another successful um, lander, Mars Pathfinder, with a little rover attached that was sort of toy sized rover, um, didn't go very far, a few hundred meters, um, and explored the surface geology of Mars. Um, in more recent years, the missions have become, there have been more successes than failures. Um, so NASA has been really successful with its rovers. Um, in 2003, it sent two Mars, Mars exploration rovers, Spirit and Opportunity, um, 
two at the same time because of redundancy, I think they expected at least one of them to fail. And actually, they were both successful. So they both landed on the surface of Mars at two different places and explored two potentially habitable sites. So those are sites where it's thought that there were once liquid water or evidence for liquid flowing water on the surface of Mars. And actually the Opportunity rover only just died. Um, so it was, it was exploring for um, more than a decade on the surface of Mars. Then we have lots of successful orbiters, um, but the next lander, the next rover was the Mars Science Laboratory. So that's Curiosity in 2011, and that rover is still operational. It was also by far the biggest rover to ever be landed, the biggest thing ever to be landed on, on the Martian surface. Um, the Mars Curiosity rover is the size of a small car. I think it weighs close to a ton. Um, so that was a really, you know, that was a really big success. Um, now, the missions that aren't included on here are the ones that I've just mentioned because they are very recent from February. So that's Mars Perseverance rover um, the Chinese rover and the UAE orbiter. They're not included on this diagram. Um, but this year has been very busy. And as you can see, there are still missions that are operational. So Mars Science Laboratory is still operational. MAVEN, we've got the InSight uh, lander <clears throat> that's not uh, it's not finished on this diagram, but that was a successful um, landing as well by NASA. Um, and now there is a Chinese uh, rover on the surface of Mars. So what are the objectives of these missions? Um, well, the UAE Hope Orbiter, um, so that's not a lander, it's just uh, orbiting uh, around Mars. Um, but the aim of that uh, mission is to look at the Martian atmosphere, so the chemistry of the Martian atmosphere and the Martian climate. Um, the Chinese rover is to, uh, the objective is to study the geology and the structure of the soil there. Um, but the NASA Mars 2020 Perseverance rover is really focused on habitability. So it's looking for signs of ancient and current life on the Martian surface. And it's also really importantly collecting rocks and soil samples and caching them in a, a collection box for future return to Earth. So there will be a future mission that goes to Mars, collects the samples, and then another mission that brings those samples back to Earth. And that's really important because there are certain studies that we can do here on Earth in laboratories that we cannot do the rover cannot do. So, um, you know, using big instruments that may be the size of a room that need huge power sources that weigh lots that you can you can never possibly send to Mars um, at the current time, but we can bring samples back from Mars and we can analyze those samples to look for signs of life. There's also a future um, European Space Agency mission, the ExoMars Rosalind Franklin rover, which will hopefully launch pretty soon. Uh, 2022, I think, is its new launch date. And the interesting thing about this rover is that it will drill into the subsurface. So it's, it has a drill that has the capability to go two meters below the surface and collect samples to analyze from below the surface. Now, this is important for Mars because there's a lot of radiation on the Martian surface. So in terms of looking for current life, or even signs of past life, what we're looking for is organic molecules. So that would be hydrocarbon chains with some kind of a functional group that contains oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus molecules, that kind of thing. The type of thing that makes up cell walls, protein, DNA um, on Earth that we know are the building blocks for life. Now, these molecules are really um, affected by radiation. They are broken down. So even... Um, the most resistant uh, microbes that we know of on Earth that are resistant to radiation, they wouldn't be able to reproduce on the surface of Mars and survive for very long because there's so much radiation coming in from the sun. The Martian atmosphere is too thin to really protect the Martian surface from this radiation. However, if we go to two meters below the surface, that radiation can't penetrate through the soil. And so two meters below the surface, you may have life that is protected from that radiation. And you may have signs of past life that hasn't broken down as much as at the surface. So that's the aim of the, the ExoMars Rosalind Franklin rover is to drill down and maybe get a sense of, um, of the complex organic molecules that aren't present at the surface. So what does life need? Um, well, life as we know it needs certain things to um, 
to evolve and to survive. So we need um, some kind of solvent, which on Earth is water. So we know we've got lots of life on Earth and life on Earth needs this solvent water um, to evolve and to um, reproduce. There also needs to be an energy source. And on Earth, that is either energy from the sun or it can be energy from hydrothermal vents. So in places like the deep oceans where the sun, sun energy doesn't penetrate, um, you can have something called chemotrophic organisms, which it just means they get their energy from the chemistry and the heat of these hydrothermal vents. So in places like the subsurface of Mars, maybe where you don't have um, any sunlight penetrating, maybe there could be chemotrophic microbial life underneath the surface. There needs to be building blocks for life. So life as we know it, as I said, is, is, is built around hydrocarbon chains. So that's carbons linked to other carbon atoms that then have hydrogen molecules and various other different molecules attached to them. And this makes up things like the double helix of DNA in life as we know it. Now, that's not to say that in other places in the solar system or other places in the universe, life has to be built around carbon uh, hydrocarbons. Um, there are theories that life could be silica based because silica as, a, as an atom also for, forms the chain molecules. Um, however, we know, um, we know more about hydrocarbon life. And so that's the specific type of life that we're looking for on Mars. Life also needs to be able to survive. So there needs to be a stable environment. We can't have huge big asteroid impacts. There can't be huge temperature fluctuations um, in, in, a habitat, in a habitat where life will survive. It has to be a stable environment. So in this case, things like the radiation on the surface of Mars may be preventative to the survival of uh, Martian life. But the subsurface environment may be more stable in terms of temperature and also in terms of having less radiation. So the mission's um, objectives really are to, to figure out, does Mars have all these things for life to survive? So is Mars habitable? And if it is habitable, did life ever evolve? Um, and is life present on the surface of Mars? For me, the interesting question is, if we find that Mars is habitable, but there is no life on Mars, then what, what kind of questions does that raise for life on Earth? It, it would really suggest that, that life is very, very rare um, and that, that the Earth is, is, is an anomaly rather than life being very column, common in our solar system and potentially in our universe. So, you know, whichever way this goes, whether there's life or whether there isn't life on Mars, is still an important question to answer, even if the answer is no. So whereabouts are we looking on the surface of Mars to get um, to find these habitable environments? This is um, a topographic image of the Martian globe. So it's just like a map of the Earth. Um, we've got uh, the southern hemispheres toward the bottom and the northern hemisphere is up towards the top of the image. Um, and the colors on this image show altitude. So the high mountains are colored in brown and orange and red. And then the lowlands are blue and um, purple. So as you can see, there's kind of uh, a difference between the northern area and the southern area of Mars. The southern area is quite high in terms of altitude. We call it the southern highlands. Apart from this big Hellas Basin, which is a very, very deep sort of impact crater in the sort of southern um, right hand side of the image there, most of the southern hemisphere is quite high. It's also very cratered. You'll see there's a lot of craters present in the, in the southern highlands. If we then move to the northern hemisphere, you can see that it's much lower and it's much smoother. There are much less craters. Now, in terms of planetary science, less craters equals younger terrain because it's had less time for craters to impact and build up over time. More craters means older terrain. So we've got the older southern highlands and then the sort of younger um, lowlands of the northern hemisphere. Now you'll see that a lot of the rover and lander missions actually focus on the area between these two regions. So that sort of green blue area where we change from southern highlands to northern lowlands and that's not an accident. 
these areas are focused on because these are the areas where there's a lot of evidence for flowing water. So things like dried up riverbeds, um, old crater lakes that were potentially filled with water, they tend to occur along this, this region where that green altitude kind of changes to blue. Some people think that in the past, Mars actually had a northern ocean and that this change in topography from the green to the blue demarks a coastline of, of that ancient ocean on Mars. Now that's not 100% agreed on, but it definitely is an area where we see a lot of activity of rivers flowing from those southern highlands down into the northern lowlands. And actually around where the Pathfinder and the Viking One and the ExoMars labels are, you can see that um, there is evidence there of, of sort of river channels and, and large channels flowing into um, the northern region. So these are some images of those river channel evidence. Now, the first time that there was really conclusive evidence that there are dry riverbeds on Mars was from the Viking orbiters. So this is uh, the, ninth, the mid 1970s. The imagery is not great. Um, this is a 160 kilometer across image and you can see it's, it's a bit pixelated, it's black and white. There's not much detail in that image, but you can definitely make out that there is a dried up riverbed system there. All of these channels merging into this larger river channel. Now, obviously, more recently with HD cameras and colour photography, we've managed to get much better resolution of the surface of Mars. And in fact, the cameras on the orbiter uh, missions that are currently working are so good that they can actually image the tracks that are left behind by the Curiosity rover, for example, on the surface of Mars. You can see things at the meter sized pixel. So, um, we're really focusing in on high resolution images. And this is a really good example. This color image is a really good example of an area uh, that I can't pronounce, Hafeus Posse. It's Latin. I think it means something like the fire god um, because it's on the side of a big volcano. Um, but this is um, a crater in the towards the top of the image there that was once thought to be filled with a lake. And the lake overflowed and formed this nice channel system that's kind of working its way towards the bottom of the image. And you can imagine that water was flowing there and there were islands in the center of this channel system. Now this system is more than 600 kilometers long. Um, it's on the flanks of a big mountain um, in a region known as Utopia Planitia. Now that's the region that China just landed its rover in. So the Chinese rover is really exploring this region the geology and the chemistry and the soil in this region to figure out, you know, is there any evidence of uh, past flowing water on Mars? When did it disappear? When did Mars dry out in this region? Those kind of questions. So it'd be really exciting to see what comes from this area in the next uh, few years. This is an image of Gale Crater. And as you probably know, this is the site for the NASA Curiosity rover. So this is where Curiosity rover landed in 2011. And this is where it is still currently exploring. And the reason for that is Gale Crater is really big. So the horizon in this image is basically showing you the crater rim. And it's thought that at one time, this whole crater was filled with a, a long lived lake. So a long standing body of water. And we know this because as you can see in the foreground here of this image, there are these layered rocks. Now these are thin layers of mudstone and sandstone, and they are quite thick layers. They're all built up on top of each other. Now these layers form by sediment coming in, by feeding in sediment into this lake from the river systems that feed the lake. And then the sediment settles out from the water column and forms these layers of, um, of sediment over time. Now the layers of sediment, the layers of rock are so thick that we know this lake must have been present for a long amount of time, purely because this amount of sediment has to build up over long periods of time. So we've got a long standing body of water here at the surface of Mars. So it's a, a very good, potentially past habitable environment. Obviously now it's dry, um, but in the past, we think this was a large long standing uh, body of water a nice lake environment for microbes maybe to develop. Okay, so we talked about the surface of Mars, but there are also orbiters that are looking at the atmosphere, um, particularly the Trace Gas Orbiter, which is a European Space Agency mission, is, is currently looking at the composition of the Martian atmosphere in terms of 
the small amounts or the trace gases that are present. So if we compare Earth and uh, Mars's atmosphere, Mars has got a very thin atmosphere, so the pressure at the surface on Mars is less than 1% the pressure at the surface of the Earth, and that's because Mars' atmosphere is really, really thin. It's currently made up of mostly carbon dioxide, so it's 96% carbon dioxide, there's a little bit of nitrogen, a little bit of argon, and then there's a bunch of trace gases, and these include methane. So methane is present as a trace gas, and methane is what we'd call it an organic molecule. It's, it's a simple organic molecule. It's just one carbon atom and four hydrogen atoms. So the trace gas orbiter, the ESA trace gas orbiter has been monitoring the abundance of methane in the atmosphere of Mars because it's an organic molecule and it's known on Earth to be produced by biological activity. So this plot just shows the abundance on the y-axis of methane in parts per billion. So as I said, it's a trace gas, parts per billion, there's a really, really small amount of it. But the trace gas orbit is really good at detecting really small amounts of methane. So these points are showing different, um, different analyses of the trace gas orbiter over time, over a period of a year. And you can see there's spring, summer, autumn and winter marked on the x-axis there. Now, what you can see from this curve that these points form is that in the spring, at the end of the spring, there is not very much methane present in the atmosphere. But as summer develops into autumn, so as the temperatures rise, the methane in the atmosphere becomes more abundant. And then as the temperatures get lower again towards the winter, the methane again kind of drops, the abundance drops, and it kind of disappears out of the atmosphere again. Now, this was confusing and, uh, and people are still trying to figure out why there is this sort of cyclical change um, of methane, but it clearly relates to the temperature at the Martian surface. There are two kind of theories about how this methane develops. Now, as I said, methane can be um, a product of biological activity. So when microbes respire, when cows eat grass, they produce lots of methane. Now, I'm not saying that there are any cows on Mars, <laughs> but there may be microbes in the subsurface that are producing methane. And what could happen is that this methane gets stored in a molecule, uh, molecules known as clathrates, which are generally present in ices um, in the subsurface. And when the surface heats up and that ice melts, the methane is then released. So in the summertime, the methane that's being produced is released. So this methane could be produced by subsurface microbes. The other scenario is that it's produced by chemical reactions between subsurface rocks and subsurface liquid water, that it's then stored in the ice and is released in the same way. Now, being able to tell the difference between whether this methane is from microbes or the methane is from just a normal abiological or geological reaction um, that doesn't involve any biology, the trace gas orbiter cannot do that. All it can give is information whether there's methane present and how much methane is there. It can't say where the methane came from. So this is an open question right now. But hopefully when we return samples to Earth, we will be able to analyze the methane that's present in the rocks and uh, determine whether it's methane that's produced by biological activity or whether it's methane that's just produced by a normal chemical reaction of rocks with um, liquid water in the subsurface. OK, so what about more complicated organic molecules that have been found on the surface of Mars? Well, Curiosity has detected organic molecules within those nicely layered mudstones um, at the bottom of Gale Crater. And some of the organic molecules that it found are called theothenes. Now, these are important because they're quite strange organic molecules. Uh, they are, as you can see in this diagram, it's a ring chain of carbon. So carbon is those black um, uh, spheres. Hydrogen is the white spheres, so it's a ring chain of a hydrocarbon, but it's including in, in that chain a sulfur atom replaces the carbon. So they're quite distinctive organic molecules. Now, Curiosity rover detected these in mudstone by drilling small holes. And you can see there's a, there's a sort of evidence of a hole there just underneath that molecule where Curiosity has drilled down into the subsurface only a few centimetres extracted some sample, analyzed it, and found the organics in there. Now, on Earth, theothenes are found um, in coal and in oil, so in fossil fuels, uh, in any environment where you've got sulfur and carbon um, combined. So coal and oil are 
uh, fossil fuels that are produced by um, the degradation of organic um, of, of organisms over time. So for coal, you know, plants, jungles get buried, um, they degrade over millions of years and you get coal, which contains theothenes. For oil, that's normally in a marine environment where you get small organisms dying, going to the bottom of the water column, getting buried, producing oil. But it's the same, same situation. You have some kind of organic organism dies and then is, is degraded and theothenes are produced. You also get these theothenes on Earth in organisms that are alive today. So white truffles is an example. Now, again, I'm not suggesting that there are any white truffles at, in Gale Crater. Um, and I'm not suggesting that these theothenes in Gale Crater are even a product of biological activity. They don't have to be produced by organisms. It's just that on Earth, because there is so much life everywhere, this is where we normally see them, is as a product of, of, of biology. They can be produced abiologically. The problem is, again, the Curiosity rover can't tell us whether they're produced abiologically or whether they're produced by microbes. All it can tell us is that they're there and that they're present in a certain abundance. We need really to, um, to bring these samples back to earth, to analyze them further, to do the type of analysis that can't be done by the rover, that you need you know, the big instruments and um, the, the big power sources to, to analyze. So, Mars sample return um, by, the, by the Perseverance rover will be excellent, but there are actually uh, Martian samples already present on Earth in the form of meteorites. Now, meteorites are kind of a random selection of, of any planet. So if we get meteorites from Mars, we don't get to choose where they come from. We don't even know where they come from on the surface of Mars. So we can't say this meteorite came from this place, you know, this meteorite came from Gale Crater, or this meteorite came from the Hellas Basin on Mars. We don't know any information like that. All we know is that they are from Mars and we can study their chemistry. Uh, and that can tell us a lot about the um, geology and the chemistry of Mars, of the Martian environment. There are organic molecules present in these meteorites, but the problem is all of the meteorites that we have they're not these nice mudstones or sandstones that we get at Gale Crater. They are basalts, which is essentially a lava. So most of Mars is very boring geologically compared to Earth, which has lots and lots of different rock types and lots and lots of different types of habitats that produce sediments um, and lots of different minerals and rocks. Mars is very boring. The vast majority of it is just volcanoes that produce lava and lava flows. And so these produce um, basaltic rocks, which are crystalline rocks. So the type of rock that you would pick up, say, in Hawaii, um, they have nice crystals in them, um, but they don't have any, um, they're not formed from sediments, they're not formed in a habitable environment, they're formed in a volcano. So while they do contain organic molecules, the abundance of the organics within these meteorites is very, very low. So this, if I just play this small video, is a, is a video that one of my PhD students made of a small organic rich inclusion within one of the Martian meteorites that we have at Glasgow. So this dark um, sort of sludgy speckly thing is, uh, is largely made up of um, a sort of tarry substance, kind of like kerogen um, or, or road tar that you would put, tarmac is, 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 is what it is really. Um, it's a very small inclusion that is, you know, less than the width of a human hair. Um, the meteorites are filled with these tiny inclusions, but because they're so small, it means that the overall percentage of organics within the rocks is really, really small. But what we can do is we can use um, instruments and laboratories here on Earth to analyze these meteorites and see how they compare to the organics that were detected at Gale Crater. So that is what my current research is focused on. So we have different groups of Martian meteorites and they range in age between 4.1 billion years old to 180 million years old. Now that age distinction is really important because the oldest meteorite at 4.1 billion years old is within the sort of early warm and wet Martian environment when we think maybe there was a Northern Ocean, when we know that the atmosphere of Mars was much thicker than it is today. So when Mars was potentially much more habitable than it is at the present day. 
So there's one meteorite that we know of that is that is that was formed at the Martian surface during this time. Most of the meteorites, however, are were formed much later during this orange Amazonian period on the timeline when we know that Mars was colder, was drier at the surface. So all of those nice riverbeds and lakes had dried out. There was definitely no Northern, Northern Ocean anymore and the atmosphere was much thinner. So potentially most of the meteorites that we have were formed in this kind of less habitable time of, of Mars's history. As I said, the majority of them are lava rocks um, that, that form from volcanoes. Um, some of them were seen to fall, which is important because um, Martian meteorites get to us by something hits Mars. A lot of material is blasted from the crust of Mars and some of it escapes Mar the Martian atmosphere. A small amount of it is directed towards Earth and then survives Earth entry and lands on the surface of Earth. And we see those as, as sort of shooting stars. Now, some of these Martian meteorites were seen to fall through Earth's atmosphere and were collected almost immediately. That's really good if we want to study the organic content of those rocks, because obviously, if the meteorite is left for thousands of years sitting on the Earth's surface, any sort of microbes or organic molecules that will be present in it are probably going to be contamination from the Earth environment that it's been sitting in. You know, maybe it was sat in mud, maybe it was sat in a jungle somewhere. It's going to get really contaminated. So the ones that were seen to fall and were picked up by somebody immediately are the really important ones in terms of looking at organic content. There have been some that were found in desert environments where people have deliberately gone to collect um, or gone meteorite hunting, as we call it, um, in Antarctica and, and dry places such as the North African desert. And those are great because um, it's quite dry there, so they don't get rained on too much. They won't get too weathered. But in terms of the organic content, we, we really want to look at the really fresh ones that were seen to fall. So. How do we know a Martian meteorite is from Mars? Now, there are many different groups of meteorites. Um, the green ones here are the asteroidal meteorites. And I just wanted to point them out because if any of you were watching the news in March, um, you will have seen that a meteorite fell over the UK in Gloucester in a place called Winchcombe. Um, and uh, the team here at Glasgow immediately rushed down. And I never thought that we would find any, but we actually found lots and lots of meteorite. And as it turns out, it was one of these chondrite meteorites that come from an asteroid, very rich in organic molecules um, and very fresh because it was immediately picked up. So just as an aside, we've got lots of that. We're analyzing it at the moment and that was very exciting, but it wasn't Martian, unfortunately. I had my fingers crossed that it was gonna be Martian, um, but it wasn't, it was an asteroidal sample. So they are very common. All of those green um, meteorites there, they're the most common meteorites that you get because they're from asteroids and there are lots and lots of asteroids in the solar system. Those meteorites land to earth all the time, but they also land on Mars all the time. Um, then we've got these blue meteorites, which, are, which is everything else. So anything that's ever been involved in um, a large planetary body. So we've got the Martian meteorites identified. We've got lunar meteorites identified. We know that those are from Mars and the, that lunar meteorites are from the moon. There are other groups in here that we know were part of a planet, but the planet has never been identified. And that's because these planets don't exist anymore. So in the early solar system, there were probably hundreds of, of rocky planets similar to Mars, similar to Earth, but not all of them survived because they all hit into each other and kind of, you know, Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars are the four rocky planet survivors of that really chaotic early period in time. So all we have is fragments that are left from these meteorites. We can group them together, but we're never going to identify the planetary body they came from because it doesn't exist anymore. But the Martian meteorites we can group together and we know they're from Mars. So how do we know they're from Mars? In my opinion, this is one of the coolest bits of science ever done, um, but I am biased because I'm a planetary scientist. So in 1975, as I mentioned, there was the first uh, successful landers, the NASA Viking landers, landed on the surface of Mars. And one of the experiments um, that they were due to do is to test the composition of the Martian atmosphere. So they sent that data back to Earth, and um, somebody had the bright idea of, oh, you know, we've got this, this group of rocks that we know are, um, in terms of the minerals that are in there, in terms of their ages, are all grouped together, but we don't know where they came from. 
Maybe they could be from Mars. And somebody had the genius idea of um, cracking open one of the small bubbles that are present inside these lavas. So as a lava crystallizes, sometimes it, catch, it captures a bit of gas from the atmosphere of whichever planetary body it's erupting onto. Um, and they popped open one of these sort of encapsulated bits of gas and they tested the composition of the gas inside the rock. And they found that it was the same as that given by the Viking lander as the composition of the Martian atmosphere. So in that way, they were able to link these meteorites with the Martian planet. So that's how we know that Martian meteorites are actually from Mars. As I said, there are various different groups. And for our analysis, we decided that we were going to look at two of the knocklight meteorites. So these are um, very fresh meteorites. They are not terrestrially contaminated. They are um, from this sort of young Amazonian dry period uh, of Martian history, but they do contain evidence of small amounts of flowing liquid water um, present within these lava flows on the surface of Earth after they erupted. So potentially they were from an environment that did have a small amount of liquid water. So this kind of gave me hope that we would be able to find um, evidence for lots of organic molecules within these two meteorites that were called Nakla and Lafayette. Now, this is where I got a student to do all the hard work. Um, so my student, Anya, spent a very long time um, having to process these meteorites. We get given a very, very small amount of meteorite to analyze because our analysis involves basically crushing the meteorite up with a small pestle and mortar, uh, powdering it, and then using various solvents to extract the organic um, molecules within there. Then we freeze down the extracts and we analyze them with um, a uh, instrument in Glasgow, which is, is called a liquid chromatography mass spectrometer. Now, this is a similar method to the method that Mars Curiosity rover used um, on the surface of Mars to analyze those mudstones at Great Gale Crater. The difference is that it actually can identify much lower abundances of organics um, than the instrument that's present on the Curiosity rover. So um, liquid chromatography mass spectrometry is normally actually used for forensic analysis of you know, tiny little blood spatters, that kind of thing, really, really low amounts of organics. And it will give you every single molecule that is present in the sample that you are analyzing. And it will tell you the abundance of that molecule as well. So that's what we wanted because we knew there wouldn't be very much organics present in these Martian meteorites. So this is our data and initially, oh, you know, this looks really complicated, but actually um, this plot is, is pretty simple to read. So anything that's in that blue circle that says all of the samples, they, those are all of our um, blanks from the lab. So that's testing that we've not got any contamination in, in the samples. Um, and we tested some terrestrial basalts from Earth as well, from the Svalbard Islands, just to compare terrestrial lavas with Martian lavas. And what we wanted to see on this plot was that all of those um, Earth samples were separate from our Martian samples. So from Nokla, which is circled in orange there, and from Lafayette, which is circled in purple. And that's what we got. There's a clear separation there between all the Earth samples, which cluster together, and those two Martian samples. Now, Nokla and Lafayette are both from the Nokla-like group of Martian meteorites. They both came from the same site on Mars, they're the same age and they were blasted from the surface of Mars at the same time. And what we were expecting is that they would plot on top of each other because they're from the same place on the same planet, the same lava flow sequence. Um, but they plot way away from each other. And this is something we really, really didn't expect. We expected them to be different to the terrestrial um, organic compounds. So we were expecting to see, you know, Martian organics are different to Earth organics. But what we didn't expect to see is that Lafayette organics are different from Nokla organics. To me, initially, I was very surprised with this. This kind of didn't make much sense. So what did we, what molecules did we find within uh, Nokla and Lafayette? Well, we did find sulfur bearing organics. That's similar to those uh, theothemes that were found at the Gale Crater. This is an example. Pentanous sulfonate is, uh, was detected in Lafayette. And this zigzag sort of chain just shows the, the carbon uh, chain, um, hydrocarbon, and it's got this functional group with a sulfur and some oxygen on the end of the molecule there. 
We also found lots of fatty acids and lipids, which are typically on earth, the kind of thing that you find making up cell walls uh, in, in, a, in a microbial cell. These are found in other meteorites, in carbonaceous chondrite meteorites, like the Winchcombe meteorite that was found in the UK recently. And they're very common in these carbonaceous chondrites. Um, they've not really been reported on Mars before. And so this was kind of like, oh, okay, well, maybe this is, you know, pointing us towards a, a source for Martian carbon that is more asteroidal um, meteorites hitting the surface of Mars and then being incorporated into these lava flows. Um, but that's, we're not certain about that. Um, so this is just an unpronounceable example of a fatty acid that we also detected in Lafayette. Generally, they're quite long chain uh, molecules. So in terms of determining whether um, the source of uh, Martian organic molecules is the Martian subsurface, so whether the, those organics come up with the lava from a magma chamber that's deep inside the, the Martian crust or in the Martian mantle, um, or whether the organics are delivered from asteroidal, you know, carbonaceous chondrite type meteorites from asteroids to the surface of Mars and then incorporated into um, lava flows that, that made up the narcolite meteorites. We're not certain uh, at the moment. I can't say we need more, we need more data. Um, but what I would like to focus on is, is what I just mentioned, is, is why is Nakla so different from Lafayette? Because this took us down a very unexpected rabbit hole. Um, so this was a very surprising plot. And as you can see, Nakla and Lafayette are very separated here. So they have very different organic compounds. Now, Lafayette. Um, Nokla was seen to fall in Egypt in 1911 and was collected very soon after it fell. So it has a very clear fall history. Someone saw it fall, someone picked it up. It was given to the Natural History Museum in London. Lafayette is, is uncertain. So this um, bottom right image shows Lafayette, the outside of Lafayette, and you can see it looks really glassy and it has these lovely flow lines on it. And that's typical of a very fresh meteorite where you can see what's called the fusion crust, which is this black um, glassy exterior. Now, if a meteorite has been sat around on Earth for any amount of time, that sort of black outer layer disappears and you start to see rusty spots. And then eventually um, the interior of the meteorite will be cracked and broken open. So Lafayette looks very fresh. Now there is a story um, that it fell in a place called Lafayette in Indiana, and it was definitely found in a drawer at Purdue University, which is in Lafayette in Indiana, and recognized as a meteorite in 1931. But what's not known is what where it came from before it was put into that drawer. There's a story that there was a black student at the University of Purdue who saw the meteorite fall as he was fishing and it fell in the lake. He fished it out of the lake, he took it home and eventually he donated it to Purdue University. But unfortunately, the student has never been identified because we weren't sure of when um, it fell, what year before 1931 this meteorite fell. Um, the member of staff that he told and uh, gave the meteorite to died and the person who published this paper um, that's on the left-hand side, which was published in 1931, Nininger never met either the student or the member of staff. Um, I think it was hearsay at this point that this is what where this meteorite came from. So this is a good story, but it's not corroborated. The year that it fell is unknown. The student that, that, that this story came from was never found, but it does look very fresh. So. I'm telling you this because the molecules that we found in the Lafayette meteorite, by far the most abundant um, organic molecule we found in this meteorite was something called vomitoxin. Now, immediately this jumped out at, at myself and my student because normally complex molecules like this do not have a name. They are numbered and they have a very long sort of um, uh, nomenclature name in chemistry. They don't have a nice short um, name like this. They only have a name if it's a known molecule that has been studied and that is known to form in some way. Um, so that name jumped out at us and we did a bit of digging um, during lockdown when we had nothing to do. And we found out that it's produced, vomitoxin is produced by a, a disease that affects wheat. 
it's a fungal disease known as whitehead scab. And it, it really causes wheat crops to fail. So it's a very studied molecule. This also means that it's very likely that this is a terrestrial contaminant from the place that Lafayette fell. So this gave us a clue as to trying to figure out where the fall site for Lafayette is. Where is this vomitoxin, this whitehead scab molecule prevalent in the world? So what we know is that um, whitehead scab is produced in warm and wet spring times uh, when there's been lots of rain before the wheat flowers and as it flowers on irrigated farmland rather than rainwatered farmland and where wheat is planted the year after wheat has been planted or corn has been planted. So we're looking at an irrigated, arable, permanently arable farmland in a warm, wet climate. Now, Lafayette is in Indiana, in Central America, which is a very arable um, state. And near Lafayette itself um, is Tipico County, um, which is an area of 1,303 kilometers squared. Now, on doing a bit of research, one of the first websites we found was actually a website from Indiana. Um, there's a whole institute dedicated to this whitehead scab because it's so prevalent in Indiana that crops fail and it makes livestock sick, um, which we think is why it's called vomitoxin because it makes livestock vomit. So it poisons livestock. So they really keep track and have kept track of, of outbreaks of this disease since the 19th century. So Purdue University was founded in 1869. So that gives us a 62 year window in the Indiana region where we can say, OK, we think the whitehead scab um, vomitoxin is present in Lafayette, which shows that it was it fell in an area where there's lots of whitehead scab. We know this is prevalent in Indiana. We know that Purdue University was founded in 1869. So there's 62 years between then and 1931. So we tried to track down um, years when vomitoxin when whitehead scab was very prevalent and does that coincide with years when there were black students at Purdue University graduating. So it's a complicated detective story. <laughs> I just put that picture in because uh, I find it funny that I, it makes pigs vomit and that's why it's called vomitoxin. Um, so apparently 1919 was the year for whitehead scab in the in the uh, Tipico County region where it was very, very prevalent. So that seems like a very likely fall year. And at the moment, what we're trying to do is track down um, whether there was a black student that graduated or that was present at Purdue University in and around 1919. Now, that may seem like a difficult job, but actually it's not difficult at all. The founding of the university in 1869 and 1931, there were only three black students that graduated from Purdue University. All three of them were present during that time, during 1919, and could have, could have graduated um, during that time. So the search continues as to who done it, who, who, which one of those three students was potentially the, the person that saw Lafayette fall and can corroborate the story. Um, and we're currently trying to um, get some more information about those students and potentially get in touch with relatives to see if, you know, granddad ever talked about seeing a meteorite um, fall. But we, we, we're very happy that we've kind of tracked down and, and potentially corroborated and figured out the story of, of how um, Lafayette kind of came to be in this draw at Purdue University. OK, so with that, I'm going to I'm going to stop um, and I uh, hopefully there are time for some questions. Thanks so much, Lydia. I absolutely love that. Um, almost like a whodunit. Yeah, <laughs> it. um, it's such a really interesting way to like trace back a sample through time and I guess reinforces the importance of good sample collection and recording, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I think whoever was the curator that just put that um, sample in a drawer, um, I think they thought it was a glacial rock and was unimportant. Um, and it does make me wonder whether if the student had been a white student, would they have paid more attention to the story, you know, um, because this is 1931, uh, I think 
maybe the fact that it was a black student, they just thought, well, you don't know what you're talking about, you know? If it had been a white wonder, student, would it have been different? Um, I wonder but, how many meteorite samples are languishing in drawers because uh, <laughs> they weren't correctly identified at the time. I suspect there are lots of meteorites in drawers in ancient museums just sitting there waiting to be rediscovered. <laughs> um, it makes me think, I mean, you spoke about the Winchcombe meteorite and at the time the Geological Society was actually contacted by so many people who were in the area and wanted to know if they could go out looking for a meteorite and if so what to do when they collected one and I thought maybe I'd start by asking you what should someone do if they think they've found a meteorite sample and how can they make sure that you guys the scientists can use it um, in your science. Yes um, so that was Winchcombe was a really difficult um, collection because it was obviously during lockdown and people were not allowed to travel so we actually had to um, get special permission from the university, um, from the, the VIPs at the university to even travel down there to go and have a look ourselves. And what we didn't want is for, you know, people from all over the country to suddenly descend on this, what is a really small rural town and potentially bring COVID um, into the area. So um, we kind of discouraged anybody from doing that at the time. Um, now things have opened up a bit more, you know, feel free, go out there. <laughs> um, what what um, people shouldn't do is, is use a metal detector because it is a very easy way of finding um, certain types of meteorites. But what you do when you put a metal detector near a meteorite is you kind of erase some of the data that is scientifically important. Um, because we, we look at the magnetic signals from meteorites and that tells us all kinds of interesting stuff about the planet that it came from. And if somebody has had a big magnet near it, then that's kind of wiped that information away. What you will see normally is a black rock that looks like any other rock. So for us looking for Winchcombe, um, the person that found it on their driveway had seen uh, my colleague Luke and Ashley from the Natural History Museum on the TV um, the night before. And they went out the next morning and they noticed this black pile of rock. And they'd luckily just been watching the news where Luke was saying, you know, if you see a black pile of rock in that area, then it's not rubbish, you know, please pick it up and put it in a bag. And they put it in a, a plastic bag, which meant that it was collected 12 hours after it landed. It landed on a driveway. There wasn't rain that night. So it's a completely pristine sample. So I'm really, really excited about that. Um, we then went out and found lots and lots of other bits, but we, we basically did a police search where we, you know, we combed the area and um, like you see a police lineup when they're looking for evidence in fields. Um, and we were looking through a lot of sheep fields and meteorites look very much like sheep poo. They're, they're covered in a black glassy exterior and they're the size of, of, of sheep poo. So we did, we'd had a lot, had a lot of false alarms, um, but eventually we found it a big, a big bit. And um, it was actually Luke's girlfriend who is not, um, a scientist who had pointed out probably nine bits of poo earlier that day and said is this a meteorite and we were like oh no and then she said oh I think this is one and we were like oh okay and then Luke was like oh my god it is and we found a really really big chunk um, that had those nice flow lines of, of fusion crust on it um, and that's the piece that's currently on display uh, at the Natural History Museum so um, people can go and have a look at that now. That's some of the non-glamorous parts of fieldwork that maybe are <laughs> lesser talked about, huh? Yeah. <laughs> the combing through sheep fields part. Uh, but it's also really nice that these are the kind of samples that, you know, can be found by the public or, you know, by somebody who's not necessarily a geologist and are just out there and kind of waiting to be discovered. Absolutely. Um, with that in mind, I, somebody's asked why there aren't more recent meteorites from Mars. And I guess this question kind of can maybe be taken two ways. Um, maybe why are there not more recent geological samples that are coming from Mars, but also what um, affects the timing of meteorite sort of um, meteorites falling to Earth and, and yeah, how does that, how does that work? Yeah, I, I, that's a very interesting question and it's actually something that my, my boss at Glasgow is studying at the moment, because certainly with um, the, the type of meteorite that is Winchcombe, so that's carbonaceous chondrites, there does seem to be a cycle where every 10 years, or is it 30 years, I've forgotten, but there's a cycle of a couple of decades, we get a flurry of falls that are reported, and then it's kind of quiet. And that would kind of suggest that maybe there's some kind of 
um, broken up asteroid that is near Earth that we, we can't see um, because it's maybe quite small or it's a rubble field that comes close to Earth um, every 30 years or so. And then, you know, bits are more likely to fall to Earth. Um, with Mars, there hasn't been any, any kind of cycle of um, Martian uh, falls. It's just the case that um, people have studied why there are not more meteorites found now than there were when, you know, there were only less than a billion people on the Earth. You would think there's more people, there's more cameras looking at the sky. Why are there not more meteorites found recently or seen to fall recently than back way back when? I think the answer is that people are, are indoor people now. People used to be outside every night, you know, looking at the sky because there was no Netflix. So <laughs> there was nothing else to look at. Um, but there hasn't been an increase in, in fall sightings. They are very difficult to find. You need to have um, more than one person see it so that you can kind of triangulate the direction that it was going, where it fell. Obviously, most of the Earth is ocean. So we do have a camera network in the UK that looks at the sky. And that's partially how we found Winchcombe is because we triangulated that fireball that was seen and we, we pinpointed down to that, that small area. Um, but we have had some near misses where it's, you know, it's gone in the North Sea or it's fallen somewhere in Sweden, maybe. If it falls anywhere like Scotland, um, if it falls in the summer over England, you are very, very unlikely to find it because any amount of grass, even grass that's sort of ankle height, you'll never find a meteorite in there unless it's a huge one that's made a big crater. They don't make big craters. They tend just to plop on the ground and sit there and they just look like any other rock. So unless you physically see it fall, it's really difficult to find them. Something I guess that makes something that's already quite rare feel even rarer when you get your hands on that little piece that you get to put in your mass spectrometer. Oh, definitely. I mean, I, I said to Luke when we found that meteorite, you know, this is the highlight of our career and it's all downhill from here. <laughs> um, so I've got a question here from Irene who wants to know, obviously we have meteorites that fall to Earth from lots of different planets, uh, Mars being one, but are there meteorites of Earth and other planets on other bodies in the solar system. So do other planets also get meteorites? Yes, absolutely. Um, so that is something that is really highly sought after, is a meteorite of Earth that we can find on the moon, because Earth has um, plate tectonics, so the crust is, is being recycled all the time. And what that means is that we don't have rocks from Earth's earliest history. So in terms of us figuring out the early history of Earth, we don't have any geological record, but there could potentially be a meteorite, an Earth meteorite present on the moon somewhere that was blasted to the moon, you know, four billion years ago and has just been sitting there. There's no weathering on the moon. It's just going to be perfectly preserved in this vacuum atmosphere, but nobody's found it yet. But that would be a really exciting find when we do find that. Okay, that's exciting. So um, maybe Irene could be the person who could uh, be the scientist who could find that and study that really unique sample as well. Um, I think we've probably got time for one last question. Um, it's about how scientists such as yourself can tell the difference between life that originated on Mars or organic molecules that originated on Mars and those that might have been brought by us. And I think you touched a little bit on that in when you were showing us one of your plots. I mean, you have lots of kind of samples that you run through the machine to show you what an Earth version might be. But could you tell us a little bit about how you, um, I guess, confirm that the life or the organic molecules that you're picking up from these samples are definitely not just ones that we've put there in the first place? Yeah, um, that is that is also a really good question. So for the Mars sample returns, the, um, the probe that is sent up, everything is sterilized to the highest, highest degree before it's sent there to make sure that we don't contaminate Mars with, with Earth life. Because obviously we don't want to um, wipe out anything that could potentially be present there. We don't want to confuse ourselves by you know, detecting Earth life just because it's come back from Mars, but we, we took it there in the first place. Um, that's something that, that NASA and all of the space agencies are really, really careful about. Um, in terms of meteorites, it is more difficult because they they have they have they have got um, 
terrestrial contamination in them. But there are things you can do to separate out the terrestrial molecules from the Martian molecules. One of the best ways of doing that is to look at um, hydrogen, different types of hydrogen that are present in those hydrocarbon molecules. So on Mars, the hydrogen um, is heavier. Most of the hydrogen has a heavier mass. So its atom is, is actually heavier. So you can analyze that in the labs here on Earth and you can look at the hydrogens that are attached to each one of those carbon molecules. And you can say that molecule is Martian because it has heavy hydrogen. That molecule is terrestrial because it has light hydrogen as we would expect on Earth. Unfortunately, um, the instrument that does that is, you know, the size of a room. It requires huge power sources, huge big magnets. You would never be able to do that um, with a with a rover currently. Um, so, so the Curiosity rover can't can't tell us whether it's just looking at contamination that it's brought itself. We're pretty sure it's not, um, because they're all tested. You know, anything, any rubber that's attached to them, they're all tested for what molecules are present in there, and so they know the record of all the molecules that they're likely to detect that are on the rover. Um, but yeah, in terms of um, Meteorites, it needs to be um, this, this hydrogen study, which is something that we are working on. That's the next stage of, of our analysis to pick out which ones are definitely Martian and which ones are definitely terrestrial molecules. Well, that's really exciting that somebody had the foresight to you know, predict actually where the research is going as well as ask some questions about some of the older yeah. stuff. Um, thank you so much, Lydia. This has been absolutely fantastic. Um, I see in our Q&A, actually, somebody's just asked if a recording will be available, um, and it will. So if anybody didn't catch the beginning or you want to watch again, um, it'll be available on our YouTube um, as soon as this is over. So you can catch up anytime, you can watch again, and you can share this lecture. Um, thanks so much, Lydia. For no problem. This was fun. And uh, I, hope, I hope maybe we can see you all again next time for our next public lecture. So thanks and goodbye.